Hello and welcome to this presentation of the paper Did the Indian Capital Controls Work as a Tool for Macroeconomic Policy by Ila Patnaik and myself. Uh, before we get started on the actual work, I want to motivate the question. There is a good deal of literature on the subject of a country that is largely open and introduces temporary capital account restrictions. That's a setting that we think we understand. By and large, capital controls do not work too well when applied in this setting. That raises a curious question about an alternative strategy. Suppose you have a country which has permanent and comprehensive controls. Suppose you do not become largely open. Is it then the case that capital controls are useful as a tool for macroeconomic and financial policy? That's what we do in this paper with a careful country study of one of the two major countries which does this, namely India. The other major country is China. Okay, in the international finance literature, we know that financial integration is a problematic thing. On one hand, it can improve growth by reducing the cost of capital and improving risk sharing. And indeed, most emerging markets have removed capital controls over the years. But when we do the cross-country analysis of growth, we don't see a positive impact of capital account openness upon growth. So this is a great debate uh, into which this paper is located. A whole group of concerns have been articulated in recent years from the viewpoint of macroeconomic and financial policy. And here is a rough uh, recipe for trouble. Uh, the Typical problem that we see is that a country will sometimes experience a surge in capital inflows and at that time a big exchange rate appreciation can take place which can hurt the tradable sector. If the authorities try to manage the exchange rate then this can come at the price of autonomy of monetary policy which can give credit booms and asset price bubbles. And all too often a surge is followed by a sudden stop or a capital flow reversal. And that can be pretty painful for firms and governments who have currency exposure on their balance sheets. Okay, so this is the broad recipe through which we think that there are areas of concern in the consequences of capital account openness. Now, when we look at any one country's experience, as we do in this paper for India, we need a systematic framework to think about costs and benefits. So here is the approach that we take in this paper. On one hand is the costs. There are microeconomic distortions which come in two kinds. The first is that capital controls can drive a wedge between the onshore and the offshore price of a financial asset, between the onshore and the offshore rate of return. So it can a, a capital control can give you a violation of the law of one price. It can lead to a breakdown of arbitrage. And the second kind of microeconomic distortion is that there are a variety of behavioral distortions where economic agents start doing things which are not so efficient in the presence of the controls. The second uh, area where uh, we break new ground in this paper is to highlight the problems of governance that come about when you, can, when you have a comprehensive and permanent system of capital controls and we'll talk a bit more about that as we go. Now, all this is done for a reason. So, for example, some authors argue that because they are able to demonstrate that the law of one price is indeed violated, that the capital controls are indeed effective. And nobody would deny that. They are indeed effective. But is that what you want? Is that the objective? No. The objectives lie in a different direction. So, there are five areas in which macroeconomic and financial policy would like to achieve something. And the hope is that a system of capital controls, a permanent and comprehensive system of capital controls is the way to get that. What are these five things? The first is, could you make a difference to the magnitude of inflows in a surge? The second is, can you retain the autonomy of monetary policy when a surge arises and when you are battling with an exchange rate problem? Uh, can you retain control of monetary policy? Can you avoid overheating the economy? The third is, can you avoid a real exchange rate appreciation, which can be pretty painful for the tradable sector? The fourth is the area of asset price bubbles and credit booms. Can you avoid extreme boom and bust in the asset market? Can you avoid a huge credit boom? And finally, 
can you avoid uh, currency exposure on the part of firms and the government? Can you avoid the balance sheet effects, which uh, are the source of so much trouble in international financial crises? This is the systematic approach that we bring into our examination of the Indian story. And uh, to give you a quick preview of uh, what we find, after 2000, like most emerging markets, India got a big surge in capital controls, uh, sorry, in capital inflows, and India tried to combat this using capital controls. And uh, was this experience very different from what we know in the literature about countries which had largely dismantled capital controls and tried to introduce transitory controls? Um, it's a mixed bag. There is some evidence that India did well on holding back foreign borrowing. By and large, the controls did not deliver on the objectives of macroeconomic policy. And uh, while the controls did do well on holding back foreign borrowing, they did not fare well on avoiding the currency exposure of firms. And uh, we are going to argue that the Indian experience raises concerns about governance and about the rule of law. So let me get started with a description of uh, the Indian system of capital controls. The capital controls were introduced by the British in 1942 and they have never been dismantled. So India never went through a liberalization. Every single element of cross-border activity is controlled. Everything is prohibited unless explicitly permitted. And there are comprehensive rules that cover everything. So there are quantitative restrictions uh, alongside a few price-based restrictions. These are very detailed microeconomic interventions over and above the normal business of financial regulation and supervision. And indeed, if you went back uh, to 2000 or 2002 and you had a chat with policymakers, there was quite a bit of confidence that we have so many levers, we have so much uh, uh, of room to maneuver in terms of making changes to the hundreds of capital controls that we could pretty much do what we like. We can achieve a stable exchange rate. We don't uh, face a problem with the impossible trinity. We can do what we want on achieving exchange rate objectives and monetary policy objectives. So India is a nice example of a comprehensive and permanent system of capital controls. Now, when we look at four uh, global cross-country databases about de jure openness, unsurprisingly, we find that India is more closed when compared to other large emerging markets. And we get similar outcomes for de facto measures also. So this system of capital controls did deliver a more closed economy. The first area of examination is market distortions. A series of papers have been written about the Indian experience with capital controls and these capital controls that bind did succeed in inducing distortions in the market. We get failures of the law of one price. Covered interest parity breaks down. ADRs are priced differently from domestic shares. And it's important to emphasize that whether there is a surge or there is no surge, the distortions are with us all the time. India suffers from these microeconomic distortions at all times. Now let's look more closely at the events. From 2000 onwards, uh, emerging markets got a big surge in capital flows. And uh, in India, there was a lot of stress on the prevailing strategy of exchange rate management and monetary policy. India tried to use the capital controls toolkit here, but remarkably in sync with what is now the new IMF view about capital controls. This was done after many, many preconditions were in place. There was a fiscal tightening, sterilized intervention was attempted, the exchange rate was made more flexible and after many, many elements of that, uh, from 2006 to 2007, a large number of controls were rolled out. And so the question we ask is, how did this fare? So the first element of macroeconomic objectives is to make a difference to the magnitude of a surge in capital inflows. Uh, here are the two critical graphs. On the left-hand side is the capital surge measured in billion USD. This is in log scale. So at the top, it goes all the way up to $100 billion in a year. And on the right-hand side, this is uh, capital inflows relative to GDP, which goes all the way up to 8% to GDP. So this is a pretty big capital surge by world standards. And I don't think we can argue that the permanent and comprehensive system of capital controls delivered a fairly small capital inflow surge. Now in this, uh, did we manage to obtain autonomy of monetary policy? Uh, one way to think about this is, was India able to hang on to an erstwhile exchange rate peg 
and preserve autonomy of monetary policy? And the answer is no. Uh, in the biggest ever business cycle expansion, the policy rate expressed in real terms fell from plus 3% to minus 4%. And there are some inter interesting anecdotes from this period. Here is a cover story from The Economist in 2007, which uh, says that India is overheating. Uh, here is a cartoon from a newspaper at the time, which shows the central bank governor and the deputy governor fiddling as the inflationary fires burn. So the uh, monetary policy strategy was way out of line compared with the overheating that was going on in the economy at the time. Now, the exchange rate regime did not survive the capital inflow surge. Uh, this graph shows a picture of the moving window rupee dollar volatility. Okay, So each point in this graph is annualized volatility of the rupee dollar over a two year window. And what we see is that uh, roughly in 2000 we start out with an exchange rate regime which is a uh, soft peg to the US dollar. There is an annualized volatility of 1.84%. In the first phase of the surge the exchange rate regime became more flexible. On the 23rd of May 2003, the volatility of the exchange rate went up to 3.87%. And then on the 23rd of March 2007, once again, the volatility went up to 8.61%. So you see a substantial enlargement of exchange rate flexibility through this period. So if you believed that a good capital control system is able to give the country the ability to hang on to a pegged exchange rate and avoid the problems of the impossible trinity, then that's not what was achieved in India. Here's a picture of monetary policy autonomy through this period. This is the Eisenman et al. measure from 2010. Uh, what we see is that from the late 90s onwards, there was a sharp decline in monetary policy autonomy to the lowest levels ever. So when the surge came after 2000, there was a sharp decline in monetary policy autonomy. In fact, when you look closely at these dates, India regained monetary policy autonomy by depegging the exchange rate. It is when the exchange rate became more flexible that monetary policy autonomy was regained. Now we turn to the question of real exchange rate appreciation. This is the graph of the real effective exchange rate. And you see a pretty big, big appreciation. It goes from a bottom of roughly 85, an index level of 85, to a top of an index level of 115. So there's a fairly big real effective exchange rate appreciation. So the permanent and comprehensive system of capital controls did not deliver in preventing a real effective exchange rate appreciation. Now we turn to the question about asset price booms and credit booms. So first, uh, bank credit was growing at over 30% in the boom. What was going on is that sterilization was only partial. So there was a lot of intervention going on in trying to prevent the exchange rate appreciation and that was spilling over into domestic liquidity. So we got a very big uh, boom in bank credit. Uh, we quantify the boom and bust in asset prices by dividing the highest level of the stock price index upon the lowest level of the stock price index in focusing on the period from 2004 to 2008. And across a group of emerging markets, the three countries with the biggest boom and bust cycle in uh, the stock market were Peru, China and India. So it's interesting to see that many countries like Chile and Israel who had high capital account openness did not get this kind of boom and bust. So it's not clear that the system of capital controls was useful in getting to uh, minimum, uh, minimal asset price boom and a minimal credit boom. Finally, we turn to capital controls and their impact on debt inflows. So the first element is a success story. India had a quantitative restriction on the dollar value of foreign borrowing, on the outstanding dollar value of foreign debt. So over the years, as the economy grew, you do get a sharp decline in foreign borrowing as percent of GDP. So in that sense, the comprehensive and permanent controls did deliver in reducing the incidence of debt. But let us remember that reduction of debt is only a means to an end. That end is balance sheet exposure. We worry about debt because of currency mismatches on the firms and for the government. There's nothing bad about debt per se, but what is bad is about having currency mismatches. So let's look more closely at what was going on with balance sheet exposures. Um, Eli and I have a paper where we look at several natural experiments 
where the Indian exchange rate regime becomes more flexible and less flexible. And what we find is that the currency exposure of the firms moves around in sympathy with the flexibility of the exchange rate regime. When the exchange rate regime becomes more flexible, the firms take less exposure. When the exchange rate regime becomes more rigid, the firms are free riding on the protection being given to them by the central bank and they take a bigger exchange rate exposure. So this is a moral hazard story. The capital controls don't seem to have been able to prevent the firms from modifying their currency exposure. The capital controls don't seem to have prevented firms from speculating on the exchange rate using their balance sheet. So in this sense, we have not got the result that was desired. Here is another example of the ineffectiveness. The black line is the interest rate on the call money market, the domestic interbank market, in the year of uh, 2008. The vertical line is the 15th of September 2008 when Lehman went, went bankrupt. The two horizontal lines are the policy rate of the central bank. Now this is a country where short dated foreign borrowing was explicitly banned. You were supposed to have no offshore borrowing of a short dated nature. So ordinarily if there was a problem in the London money market, it should have had no effect in India. But what the graph shows is that the operating procedure of monetary policy broke down. When Lehman went bankrupt, the domestic call money rate rose dramatically and went far beyond the bounds defined by the central bank in the operating procedure of monetary policy. What was going on? Eli and I have a paper where we argue that hundreds of large Indian companies had become multinationals and were running a global treasury out of London and Singapore and so on. So they were doing the money market borrowing outside India. On paper, the capital controls had worked because they had capped foreign borrowing in India. But in truth, the currency exposure was there. Here is an example of the distortions uh, that went with these attempts at preventing foreign borrowing. Uh, in India, we have end use restrictions. What this means is the government can require that a capital inflow can only be done for a certain purpose. So as an example, on the 7th of August 2007, a new capital control was introduced where the firms were told that you can borrow in dollars only for one purpose, to import capital goods. What do you think happened? Uh, many firms seem to have substituted away from buying capital goods locally. So let's look at the graph. The black line is the time series of capital goods imports and the dashed line is the time series of domestic capital goods production. So what you see is that before August 2007, the two lines pretty much go together. On 7th of August 2007, this capital control is introduced and shortly thereafter, you get a huge surge in capital good Im goods imports and slow growth in the domestic production of capital goods. Uh, this capital control was reversed on the 23rd of October 2008. And you will remember that was a very difficult time in the world economy. Yet, by late 2009, you see a huge surge in the domestic production of capital goods, which we would argue is the restoration of the previous conditions in terms of the undistorted choice by firms between importing capital goods and buying them locally. Finally, we want to turn to some new elements of the capital controls debate. This is about governance. Now, this is something we know a lot about from diverse areas of economic policy. We know that a big, complex, permanent, comprehensive system of controls is difficult to implement in terms of public administration. It is not easy for a bureaucracy to obtain sound information, to process it correctly, to resist political pressure and to come up with the right decision. And particularly in a setting like India where governance is weak, where government agencies work poorly at best, these problems are likely to be particularly acute. We've had many examples of these kinds of problems in India and in the paper we highlight four of them. Here is one. Uh, when the capital inflow surge was taking place, the government decided that they would block venture capital coming into India. Most of us would think that's not such a good thing. There are some remarkably valuable things about having venture capital. Now, how was this done? The government decided to remove the tax pass-through for venture capital. So if you wanted to be a venture capitalist, you were double taxed. That is, the venture capital organization would have to pay tax on capital gains and then the investor would have to pay capital gains tax once again. 
this was done for all industries other than nine so the government did industrial policy nine industries were chosen these were industries such as poultry farms and seed production and nanotechnology and so on so the government chose nine industries which would have tax passed through all other industries were double taxed that was their way of trying to prevent foreign capital from coming into the country this was done not just for foreign venture capital it was done for domestic venture capital as well so this was a big blow for the development of the domestic venture capital sector it does not seem like a very well thought out policy now layered on top of this there was a breakdown of the rule of law uh, suppose a venture capital fund said that i am willing to be double taxed when i invest in anything other than these nine sectors the rule of the the law as then constructed was that the venture capital fund had to go to the reserve bank of india and ask for permission to open a bank account only then it could do operations in india it turns out that at that time the reserve bank of india did not give venture capital funds the permission to open bank accounts now that was a violation of the rule of law even though the venture capital fund said i am willing to be double taxed if i invest in anything other than these nine sectors the rbi was not allowing them to open bank accounts using powers that were not given to the rbi under the law there is a second example uh, when a global uh, organization wishes to invest in india they are supposed to go to the securities regulator sebi and become a registered fii a foreign institutional investor well at the time when the capital surge was taking place sebi was not giving registrations to certain kinds of foreign investors again this was a violation of the rule of law the law did not authorize sebi to block certain kinds of investors but they were doing so anyway the third example that we will show is something called the automatic route some kinds of foreign borrowing was supposed to be on automatic route but this is india so nothing is uh, devoid of bureaucracy so the way automatic route uh, works in india is that the firm is supposed to make an application to the reserve bank asking for permission to do this borrowing and that permission is always given because it's an automatic route but in order to give that permission a meeting has to be scheduled and it turns out that at the time of the capital surge those meetings were never held so effectively this foreign borrowing was blocked and that was a violation of the rule of law the law did not give rbi the authority to not hold these meetings uh finally the, there was an odd episode where india tried to ban the uh, transactions in otc derivatives on indian underlines outside the country this is even though india has no jurisdiction on the activities of global financial firms outside india there were attempts by the indian authorities at trying to ban this so to conclude where does it leave us i think we should interpret these results in two ways the first idea is that we know some uh, evidence from the existing literature about what happens when a country has largely opened up and introduces transitory controls we know that these controls do not work too well by and large our results for india which has a system of permanent and comprehensive controls are pretty similar to that so i think one conclusion is that the ability of capital controls to deliver on the goals of macroeconomic and financial policy are limited even when you have permanent and comprehensive controls the second idea is about a welfare choice suppose you were asked to choose between being largely open and occasionally using transitory controls versus being largely closed with a permanent and comprehensive system of capital controls which would you choose what our results suggest is that with a permanent and comprehensive system of capital controls uh, you do not obtain the desired benefits which is the objectives of macro policy and uh, we suffer the distortions all the time we have violations of the law of one price we have distortions in the behavior of agents we have difficulties with governance and the rule of law all the time whether there is a surge or no surge those problems are there all the time so if you had to compare i think that you are better off with being largely open and occasionally trying to do some transitory controls okay these may not be very effective but uh, this seems like a better way to go thank you